you have your Bibles this morning, let's go to uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Actually, we started in Matthew uh, uh, last year, uh, just about this time. Uh, we headed into uh, to this Gospel. Uh, today we're in uh, chapter 18, and I want us to, uh, to begin at, uh, at verse 5. As we look at, at this passage, uh, last week we looked at the uh, sovereignty of God uh, in the miracle of the fish that, uh, that Peter caught with the coin in its mouth, and, and then uh, we looked at the humility uh, that God calls us to as Christians um, when we saw Jesus telling the disciples that they needed to become as, as little children. And uh, in verse 5, Jesus continues with that idea, and he says, And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come. But woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fires of hell. And uh, let's stop right there. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. You know, last week uh, we mentioned that uh, for life to really work, we need to begin with an understanding of, of God's sovereignty and our humility. And uh, it began, really, that issue uh, because the disciples were, uh, were arguing over this issue of who was the greatest, and so uh, uh, Jesus gives them a lesson on, uh, on humility, uh, and he brings a child to them, and he, he uh, focuses their attention on this little child. Some think that, that if this occurred in Peter's house, it may have been uh, uh, Peter's son that Jesus kind of brought over on short notice and says, you know, hey, come, come over here. I want to use you for an illustration. And uh, it may have been Peter's son, uh, but, uh, but Jesus uses this child as an illustration of, of humility. And, uh, but as we look at this passage, one of the things we discover is that, that Jesus is not speaking directly to children, nor is he speaking literally here of ministry to children. Uh, the point that Jesus is making is he's speaking to adults, to adult believers. And the child is merely... Uh, an object lesson to teach that. You know, in, in verses 3 and 4, uh, Jesus says, And I say, and I said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says very clearly in verses 3 and 4 that uh, we are to become like little children, and to humble ourselves like little children, and that means he's using this as an illustration. Uh, in fact, as we look at this passage in these later verses, you know, it seems odd that Matthew would suddenly shift his focus towards children's ministry. And a lot of times we take this passage, and that's how we interpret it, of saying, well, don't cause the little ones to stumble and be a good example for them as a parent. And, and don't lead your children into the same sins that you struggle with. Deal with them yourself. Now, we could approach the passage that way, but I don't think that's the intent of what Matthew has here in this passage. And, uh, and, uh, and so Jesus is saying something more. And as we come to this next section... Uh, I believe that Jesus is speaking, then, of new believers. 
who have humbly come to faith in Christ. And he tells these disciples that they are to welcome these new believers in their midst, accepting them into their fellowship as they would accept and welcome Christ himself. In verse 5, Jesus says, uh, And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. And, and so if he has already said that he's speaking of a child as an example of a new believer, then that's what he's talking about in verse 5. So he's saying, whoever welcomes this new believer in my name, you are welcoming me. Uh, and, uh, and we may wonder why Matthew records this, this whole event. But if we look at this passage carefully, you know, scholars tell us that, uh, that Matthew was uh, probably writing this gospel from Syria. Uh, before there was terrorism in Syria, okay? Uh, but it was uh, in, in uh, Syrian Antioch. Uh, and, and as some scholars believe, Syrian Antioch was the first place that the message of Christ was offered to Gentiles. Now, all of a sudden, you begin to see, if that's the case, what Matthew may be talking about here. Because suddenly... Uh, we see then that, that there are Gentiles coming into the church in Syrian Antioch. And they would have special needs, and they would be different. They wouldn't have the biblical knowledge that Jewish believers in Christ would have. In fact, they would have almost no biblical knowledge at all. They would be dealing with sin issues that, that maybe the, the Jews wouldn't be primarily dealing with. And... Uh, and, and, and so this, this uh, was really a new problem that the church was facing. And so I think that's why Matthew probably focuses on that at this point. Now, we see this in Acts chapter 11. Let's go over there for just a minute. In Acts 11 and verses 20 and 21, there uh, uh, Luke tells us that... Uh, the uh, disciples, these were Jewish believers, were scattered with the persecution that uh, was connected with Stephen in verse 19. And, uh, but it says they scattered, traveling as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and he says, and Antioch. That's where they were hiding out, okay? When things got hot in Jerusalem, many of these Jewish believers went up to Syria and into Antioch, where they settled. And it says, at that point, many of these Jewish Christians began telling the message. Uh, 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 it says in verse 20, some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also. So primarily they were talking to Jews, but it says some of them were just going a little nutty. They were talking to these Gentiles. And it's like, well, wait a minute, we're good Jews. The gospel couldn't be for, for Gentiles. They're Gentile sinners. We shouldn't even approach them with this gospel. Jesus is for us, for us Jews, not for anybody else. And so it says they told them the good news about the Lord Jesus. And the Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now, that means there were a lot of new little believers in Antioch that were Gentiles. And they came out of all that Gentile culture with all the sins that were associated with that. And, uh, uh, and, and they brought all the problems with them that would come with new believers coming out of a Gentile culture. And, uh, and Jesus recognizes that when this happens, his disciples are going to be facing some issues. There's going to be a resistance to this. And there was. We see it all through the book of Acts. This resistance to Gentiles coming into the church. And it was hard for people to get a hold of this idea, the Jewish believers. So, so Jesus seems to be preparing his disciples for the resistance that they would face with this greater expansion of the gospel to all men. And he was encouraging his disciples to welcome these messy Gentiles into their fellowship. 
Because up to this point, the, the, the Jews had said, you know, we separate ourselves from these Gentiles. They're Gentile sinners. We won't have anything to do with them. And Jesus says, no, they're, they're going to be a part of you. And you've got to be ready to do this. Now, you see, that begins to pull this passage into context of what Matthew's trying to tell us here. And, uh, and, and, and he's saying to the disciples that, uh, you know, guys, I'm going to send you some, some people that are not like you. And you know what? Jesus is still doing that in the church today. He sends us people who maybe aren't like us. But somehow he makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. As we welcome them into the body of Christ, enfold them and love them, God works a miracle that breaks down the walls of, of, of ethnic and languages and, and culture, and he makes us one in Jesus Christ. Now, I think that's what Matthew was talking about here. Often, you know, uh, our tendency is to be satisfied with people like us. But we're not as excited about anyone outside of our mold that, uh, that, that doesn't look like us. And, and, and when that occurs, the church can fall into a focus on self. And we can say, well, it's my needs, my wants, my kind of people, my glory, and my comfort. And when that happens, the church collapses in on itself. Because we lose any sense of reaching out to anybody different from us. And so it means the church has to constantly be on guard against this danger of internal collapse. That we only want people who look like us and are in the same economic level as us and we want everybody to be just like me. And, and some churches fall into that. A church loses its sense of, of mission that, that, that is our calling. And... And as we head into next year, one of the things that I really want us to focus on is, is three areas, and it sounds uh, uh, like the same thing, but uh, it's outreach, evangelism, and mission. In a sense, we could summarize it as mission, mission, and mission. And I'm glad that, that Alan and, and Miriam shared you know, what they're doing because they're reaching out to some people who don't look like us, and they're inviting them to come to First Baptist Church. Okay? as new believers. And Jesus says, welcome them. And when you welcome them, you are welcoming me. Okay? So when you see the face of one of those messy Gentiles, okay, or people with struggling with, with sin, it says we're to love them and we're to welcome them in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, that means then that, that we are to create a Christian community of faith that reflects the love of Christ. And I think that's what Jesus is, is trying to get to in this passage. The idea of placing Jews and Gentiles in one body of believers was something unheard of in its day. And Jesus was helping his disciples to realize that they were called to cooperate with what God was about to do. It was true that the Gentile culture was corrupt. It was immoral. And many Jewish believers were uh, probably resistant to the idea of bringing these people into the church. But God didn't really ask their opinion. Okay? And God doesn't give you a choice as to who he sends to us at First Baptist Church. Our job is just to love them. That's our task. Now, uh, God was redeeming a people for himself who would walk in holiness. And that means that Jesus, the friend of sinners, is in the business of redeeming sinners and making them into children of God. That's what he's doing. We can work with him or we can work against him. But if we're a part of the church, I would recommend that we work with him in that task, okay? But Jesus also gives a warning to those who would cause any of these new believers to stumble into sin, or maybe to be hypercritical of their messes, okay? And he says in verse 6, he, uh, he writes, But if anyone causes one of these little ones 
who believes in me to sin or to fall into deeper sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. And Jesus uh, sounds like uh, the head of the local mafia right here, okay? It's kind of like, you mess with any of these new believers, okay? I'm going to take you out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. I'm going to take that big giant millstone that has a hole in the middle. I'm going to tie it around your neck, okay? You're going to go to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee and you ain't never coming up, okay? So, so, so Jesus is giving a warning here. He says, don't mess with these little ones. I'm going to send them to you. They're new believers. Don't you lead them into sin or you will suffer the judgment. You will suffer the judgment. And so Jesus is talking tough. And he's saying, accept these little ones who come to you. Now, these little ones, uh, it's interesting in the Greek, the, the word that's used here is they're microns. Okay? He says, I'm going to send you some microns. I'm going to send you some little ones, some little people, okay? And you better take care of these little microns that I'm sending you, okay? Because uh, they need uh, a lot of care. Uh, and, and, and so Jesus warns us that we're not to cause them to, to trip up. The word that's used here is related to our modern word uh, for scandal. It's, it's really directly related to, to that word that we use. And a scandal is when someone has tripped up and fallen into sin. We use it of politicians or other people. We say, oh, what a scandal. You know? but, but it has the idea of tripping and falling into sin. But the word indicates more than a simple accident. Because Jesus indicates that these Jewish believers could offend or cause to stumble these newly born Gentile believers by failing to accept them. And many of these new Christians were coming out of slavery. And he says, and the church is not to look down on them. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to send you some slaves. Some Gentile slaves. Now, it's bad enough to send Gentiles. But Jesus says, I'm going to send you some Gentile slaves. Oh, whoop de doo Lucky us. We're, we're going to have an influx of Gentile slaves in the church. Boy, we can hardly wait for that. Now, Jesus tells them in verse 10, he says, See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. Now, it's interesting that the, the literal translation is, you are not to think down on. So he says, don't think you're such hot stuff. Don't think down on these people I'm going to send you. Love them. Okay? And, and therefore, the church was to lift up all people and to value them as human beings created in the image of God. Nor was the church to be hypercritical of the sinful failures of these Gentiles. Uh, to tell the truth, it's not unusual for new believers to fall repeatedly until they're able to stand. And every believer needs to learn how to stand before he can learn to walk. And new babies around the house just tend to fall. And if there's someone struggling with an addiction and they come to this church, they might fall and make some messes, and, but we're to love them anyway. We're to act redemptively in, in their life as a community of, of faith. And Jesus seems to be asking for patience on the part of the Jewish believers in Antioch towards these Gentiles who were coming out of the midst of an extremely immoral culture. And he's saying, little ones make messes. You know, our grandkids were just here, and, and uh, it took Sue, I think, about two days to, to clean up after them because, because, you know, Gracie is, is, she just sort of is, is kind of a garbage truck that just dumps everything she touches around the house. And, and you can follow the trail where Gracie has gone because, you know, and, 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 and she loved the little berries on the tree, and except... They would go about five or six steps and she'd say, flowers, 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 and drop them and go back and get another one and walk to some other part of the room. And, and so it made work for Sue to clean up the messes. And Jesus is saying, 
I'm going to send you some Gentiles, and they're going to make some messes. So it may make a little extra work. It may stretch your love just a little bit more. But I think you can do it. And, uh, and Jesus is saying, I'm going to change them. I'm going to redeem them. But it's going to take a little time. And I'm hoping eventually, as we continue to love Gracie, that someday she will come to our house and not leave it as a disaster area when she leaves, you know, that she will maybe learn to pick up, you know, something off the floor when she drops it. But in the meantime, I'll try to be patient with her, okay? You know, Paul describes this reality more fully in his first letter to the Corinthians, where Paul recognizes that the Gentiles are going to be dealing with some sins that maybe the Jewish believers have already thought about for a long time. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verses 9 through 11, there uh, the Apostle Paul's writing to this church in Corinth, which had a number of Gentile believers in it. He says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Do not be deceived. He says, Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, he keeps going, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And you say, that's quite a list. But then look what he says in verse 11. And that is what some of you were. It means, yeah, you made a lot of messes when you first came into the church but you've kind of learned to deal with those. And he says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Uh, so, So in the meantime then, the Jewish believers in Antioch were not to arrogantly judge these new Christians, but they were to accept them, love them, forgive them, and grow them to maturity, just as you do with your own children, okay? Your little ones. Now, that seems to be the gist of what Matthew is saying in this 18th chapter of Matthew. This was to be the first experiment in this expanded Gentile mission. It first began to really happen in Antioch. And, uh, and that church would be at the forefront of this advancing mission of Christ to the Gentiles. So, it would only be normal to expect a few messes from new believers. That's the reality, okay? One of the things Jesus has just witnessed is the arrogance of his disciples as they argued over which of them would be the greatest. And so he seems to be calling them to get this behavior under control and deal with their own messes. So he's saying, deal with your own sin because these new Christians are going to need an example. And you better be that example. Now that means that every mature Christian who has been a Christian for several years, Jesus is saying, get your act together. Behave yourself. Act in a Christian way. Get rid of your arrogance and your judgmental attitude and your bitterness and your hatred. Let it not be seen among you. Because you've got little ones who are going to follow your example. Now, he says, don't you set a bad example for these little ones who, who will be coming to Christ. In fact, he warns them that if they cause any of, them, uh, of these little ones to stumble, he said, you'll be held responsible. In all of this, we see the importance of our testimony before new Christians. If we're fighting over who is the greatest and battling within the church, it's very likely that the newest believers are the ones who will be harmed. And if you as parents are fighting, you may think that you're hurting each other. But you know what? You're hurting your children a lot worse than you're hurting each other. And that's what Jesus is saying to the church. He's saying if you're a mature believer, think about the little ones. Don't make them the victim of your sinful behavior. Now, Jesus warns us that a severe judgment awaits those who ignore his command. So 
So he's telling us that the mature believer has a responsibility to protect the faith of his weaker brother or sister in Christ. Now, that means that the mature believer has a responsibility. Now, let me go back to my granddaughter, Gracie, since we're talking about her today. And, and Travis was here this week. You know, and, and, and one of the things that, uh, that you know, it's expected that we're going to do when they come is we have these, these little uh, kind of hairband things and we tie them around like the, uh, uh, the dishes where we keep them in a little case and we, we put this little rubber band around the, the, the handles. And, and you know, and I, I, I took my, my razor to shave with and, and I, I put it in the closet, okay? So it wasn't out there in case Travis would decide he wanted to shave at some time uh, uh, during that week. But it means that as a mature believer, it is my responsibility to do that. It's not theirs. I didn't give them a list of rules and I said, now, these are the things. You do not get into the china cabinet. Uh, you will not uh, do this. You will not do this. And you will obey all these rules perfectly and you will not get into my razor. It's like, I just put it out of reach. And to care for new believers... We need to recognize it's our responsibility to take care of them. Now, uh, that means that it's our responsibility to make the church a healthy place to raise young believers. Uh, if the church is not healthy, young believers can catch the flu of sinful behavior from those around them, and they can catch it from you. Uh, if the church is to be a place to grow uh, brand new Christians, then we need to keep the nursery clean. Not talking about this nursery over here. We do need to keep that nursery clean. But the, the church community and the environment and the culture of the church needs to be clean. It needs to be a holy place where people don't catch the disease of sin in, uh, in our midst. Uh, and that means we shouldn't be fighting like the disciples were over who's the greatest. Uh, uh, and we shouldn't be blaming young believers who fall into sin because of our bad example. Now, Paul says the same thing to the Philippian church. In Philippians 2, verses 14 and 15, Paul says to the Philippian church, uh, to the believers there, he says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. So he says, if you're doing stuff by complaining and arguing, you're not blameless. You're causing some of these new believers to sin. So he said, go the extra mile to be blameless. And it says to be pure, children of God, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. And that means every Christian has a responsibility to walk in holiness. That also means that we have a responsibility to place ourselves under the discipline of the church for bad behavior. And, and Jesus is going to deal with that a little later in this passage too. But uh, it means that if we don't deal with that, um, we actually hurt our witness and our outreach that we want to do because we've fouled our, our household with the disease of sin. And it says, so we are to be blameless and pure, Paul says in Philippians, as we hold out the word of life. So, Jesus then also tells his disciples that life in the real world, he says, has enough stumbling stone, stones on its own without Christians adding more. Notice verse 7. Uh, it says, Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. The, the word that he uses there is, is stumbling stones or offending. Uh, and he says, such things must come. You know, it says they're going to happen in the world. But woe to the man through whom they come. He says, don't you be the cause of, of those. There's plenty of places for new Christians to stumble. Just don't you be the cause of it. Um, now, it's interesting that this was an issue in the early church. And Paul encourages believers to be considerate of each other and to be careful of offending unnecessarily. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, there... Uh, the Apostle Paul 
uh, speaks of this danger of, uh, of offending a, a weaker brother. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 31 to 33, uh, Paul then says to the Corinthians, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble. There is again, that as a mature believer, we can cause a young believer to stumble. And, and so he says to them, Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. Even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. And that means that if we're not dealing with our own sin, we are hurting the outreach of First Baptist Church. If we're to be a holy people, let's be a holy people, okay? So the Christian should not merely consider his own desires and preferences. He should also consider the effect of those who are new in Christ and those, uh, or those who are not yet believers. And as we saw last week, this may cause us uh, to give up some rights, that we possess for the sake of those that we are, are trying to reach uh, with the gospel, of those that we are trying to bring to maturity in Christ. Now we see that same idea. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 10, and I should have kept my finger in that. But uh, in verses 23 and 24, uh, Paul is saying everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. So he says it may be allowed, but... Maybe it's going to cause someone to stumble. Just don't do it. You may have the right, but give up the right for the sake of the, the, the weaker brother. Um, and, uh, and so he says, nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Now, not only must the Christian avoid causing another to stumble into sin, and not only must we be aware of the world's stumbling stones that threaten to trip us up, Jesus also says we need to be aware of the temptations within us that cause us to fall. And we have our own stumbling stones, areas of weakness that may, we may be drawn to a particular sin. And he says, so recognize that as well. That means that as individuals and as the church, we need to see clearly the danger of sin and deal with it. In verses 8 and 9, Jesus says, uh, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. So he says to believers, you know, deal with sin in your own life. You know, get rid of the stumbling stones. Now, sometimes people have taken this verse literally, and, uh, but it's better to understand it in terms of, of the Jewish love for hyperbole in order to make a, a greater point. We do the same thing in our language. And I don't mean it literally when I sit down at a meal and I say, I could eat a horse. Sue does not rush out, kill a horse, and set the whole thing on the table because I have said I could eat a horse. She doesn't take it in those terms. And when we read this passage, Jesus is not saying literally cut off your arm or your leg. He's saying deal seriously with sin. That's the point that, that he's making. And, uh, and he says we, we deal uh, with sin as we... Uh, see our sin clearly and we see the source of our sin, we cut it out with radical surgery and we throw it away. The idea of throwing it is get it away from you. Cast it away. Create some distance between you and that sin or that source or that temptation. And, uh, uh, and, and that's the point Jesus is making to believers. In 1 Peter 4.17, uh, he says that that's to happen within the church. Because he says, for it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. Now, uh, so if we fail to see our own sin or the cause of that sin, we are destined to repeatedly trip over it and fall down. Jesus calls us to deal radically with sin in our life and, the life of the ch and in the life of the church because we may also lead others into our sin. That's why the church is called to discipline sin.
In the context of this setting, it appears that Jesus is telling these disciples to see their own sin and deal with it so that they can help others deal with their sin. Jesus said in, in, in Matthew uh, 7 that uh, he said, before you remove the log or the speck from your brother's eye, get rid of the log in yours. And, and I think this is kind of a, a, a repetition of, uh, of that idea. There's also the possibility that Matthew records this event as a warning to some of the early Gnostic teachers who were attempting to infiltrate the church. And there was Gnostic teaching even in the area of Antioch. It was spread all over the ancient Greek world. And these Gnostic teachers were telling Christians to continue in their sin. They were telling them that they were free to sin as long as they had spiritual experiences of God. Uh, that they could be spiritual without being moral. And that would certainly have been a stumbling block to new believers and designed to confuse them and lead them astray. And so this warning may be applied to some of these Gnostic teachers who would have been present uh, in, in that area. If this is the case, the warning of judgment is directed towards those false teachers. Related to this is the possibility that Jesus is speaking not to individual Christians, uh, but to the church body, calling the church to discipline sin in its midst. And that's even likely, because as I said, Jesus is going to deal with this later in this same passage in Matthew 18. So it fits the context. Whatever the case, it's clear that as Christians, we must deal with sin. It's inevitable that sin will be found right in our path. And there is always the danger of stumbling. But as the Christian grows in his faith, it is expected that holiness will become more evident in his life. And it's expected that the church is to be a holy people. In Titus 2.14, we read that Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. And it says, Jesus wants to purify a people. That means the whole body of believers is to be a holy people. That means we need to address sin even within the body. It's not just personal sin. It's the community of faith that needs to remain pure. So if you are putting stumbling stones in front of other Christians, or if the world has cluttered your path with them, every Christian and every local church needs to clean up the path and get rid of the stumbling stones along the way in the journey toward a life that will please God for all eternity. And if you take a little one on this path right here, or right here, okay, you would say, well, I better hold your hand. You better stay close to me. Here, let me remove this rock out of your way so you don't stumble. And if you had a little one taking a hike on this path, you would take some extra effort to get those stones out of the way. Level out your path and the journey will go a whole lot uh, smoother and the journey will be a whole lot more enjoyable along the way for you and for that little one. If Jesus had just traveled all the way from Mount Hermon to Capernaum, which is what had just happened previous to this event, and he had just spent time along the road with 12 angry men fighting over who's the greatest, I can bet that Jesus was not terribly thrilled with what he witnessed in their lives. And in the same way, God is not pleased with the sins that repeatedly trip us up in our own lives and in the church. So here's a simple principle for life in Christ. Be radical in dealing with sin. When you see it, whether it's a sin of action or if it's a sin of just a stinking attitude, deal with it. Remove it. Throw it out of the path. Throw it away and get rid of it. Because we are to be a holy people. If you find some big rocks impeding your journey, or if you are placing those rocks in the path of others, toss the stumbling stones off to the side of the road and get on with your journey toward the holiness that God desires for you and that Jesus has made possible in you. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for, uh, once again, these truths from your word. And Lord, I pray that we have uh, accurately wrestled with your word, that, uh, that we might accurately understand what you are saying 
And Lord, we pray that you would apply these truths to us, Lord, and that you would help us to deal radically with sin so that we might live a life of holiness, but also, Lord, that we might protect the little ones in our midst, that they might not pick up our bad attitude, our anger, our bitterness, our addictions, but, Lord, that we would address sin within ourselves, that we might then address it in those little ones that we're trying to raise up in the Lord. Lord, bless your word to our hearts and our minds, and we give you praise in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's stand, shall we? Yeah. 
Father, we thank you that we can come to the cradle and discover that God has become man. And we see the miracle of the incarnation. And Lord, what an amazing, incredible miracle that is, that God came to us. And Lord, as we sing your praises, we rejoice with the angels of heaven, and we sing your praises with them as we join our voices with them to glorify you forever and ever. We ask all of this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, we've got that little micro print, don't we? Okay. Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth, mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn King Christ by highest heaven adored Christ the Oh.